seven years now. Know my voice. Nobody can save me but Christ. He saved me in a Marine Corps barracks. If we confess our sins, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Across the world coming live to you from my war room here in Dallas, Texas. And friends coming live to you from my war room here in Detroit, Michigan. From our war room here in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, here in Allen, Texas. And even though the location has changed, our Father's word never does. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. The Lord said, then will I hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Listen to me. The word of God has it right. Hey, family and friends coming live to you from my war room here in Dallas, Texas, where we just worship the Lord on tonight for sharing life in him and sharing his word with you. We're just in the war room here as always. Our custom is in worship, just seeking our heavenly father. Just uh, my heart is just open to hear what it is that whatever it is that we he wants to share with me and. Communion is so important, heart to heart, uh, with us as believers to our Heavenly Father. And so I'm just communing. There's some things that he's laid on my heart tonight that I want to share with you all. And we have, uh, in our past, uh, several times of sharing, um, have just been, uh, working with a, uh, thought that the Lord has laid on my heart, a concern, if you will, that has invaded my thoughts and permeated my thoughts and um has become concern for me see uh a lot of people <clears throat> aren't aware but one of the things that establishes uh before many of us are born the lord establishes some things with us and you can uh reference jeremiah the first chapter with that before many of us, uh, of us are born the lord ordains us and he calls us and he endows us and he equips us uh, to do, to carry out work that he specifically has for us. And, um, and one of the things that we spend our life doing is having that revealed to us as we come into who we are in Christ. And so that takes the Lord calling us. That takes the Lord sometimes getting everything out of our way. Some, sometimes it takes some pain and some inconvenience and it takes some things to get us to open up. But once we're open, the Lord begins to reveal to us the things that he has done in us before we came through the matrix of time. He uh, he then begins to reveal to us and allow us to understand what it is that he has purposed us to do here on the earth. Okay, and it is so important to commune uh, for many reasons, and one is is because we need to commune with the Lord in order for Him to unveil to us. Now He already knows, and He knew before He even created the world and any of us. He knew all things perfectly. He knew the, he knew historical time and the chronological time of mankind and every act that would occur and every person that would be here and every thought and our father so magnanimous. He knew all those things. But the issue is we don't know any of them. <clears throat> and so what he does is he begins to open our, our understanding to the things that he has done before we got here. And he allows us to, to, um, to uh, begin to understand uh, what he has purposed us to do. Now, in that, once we understand that, there are many different things that he purposes all of his children to do, but the one thing that remains the same is his word. That's the one thing that never changes is his word, and we're going to take a look at that in a minute. But here's, the, here's what I want to share with all of us to begin this tonight, and I want to pause for a second because... I want to, uh, uh, I want to just say it's, uh, a nice night here in Dallas, Texas. It's, um, September the 26th and it's about 1223 in the morning here. It's night. So I say night, but it's really in the morning. <clears throat> and, um, we're just going to have a fireside chat here. We're just going to let, let the Holy Spirit speak to us and, and say what it is that he needs to say. And so, um, continuing in my thought, um, and so what the Lord does is he, he allows us to understand what our purpose is. And we know, those of us who know the scripture, we know that there's fivefold ministry. 
And uh, But many of us don't understand, and I don't have the time to do an expose and a teaching on that or exhaust the measure, but I just want to talk about the anointing of an apostle, the apostleship, because I find one of the greatest markers of an apostleship, many people say, oh, you should be able to do miracles, and there are no any more apostles, the first century apostles were the 12 was all there was. If that was true, then what about the apostle Paul? He was not of the original 12, and so we understand that that's not an argument that's going to hold weight. Because it can't stand up under the question, what about the Apostle Paul? So Matthias took Judah's place, so we had 12 Jewish apostles. The Apostle Paul has dual citizenship, being that he is a Roman citizen as well as a citizen of Israel. So he is not a part of the original 12. So the 12 apostles are not all the apostles the Lord gave. But one thing I think that is greater than the apostles being able to do miracles, because that wasn't the majority of their ministry, matter of fact, it was in their ministry, it was center line, but that is not where the Apostle Paul said that he that his focus was. His focus, he said, was on preaching nothing but the Lord Jesus Christ, not the ingenuity of human wisdom, not humanism, not science, not all of these other things. And certainly there are many aids that can come to aid us in the preaching of the gospel, but those are not to be the center line of the message. So the anointing of the apostle, I find that we do have modern day apostles and I find there are many markers, but one of the greatest ones is concern for the kingdom of the Lord, for his word, and for his heart. And then the expression of that to the people. And that's why the Apostle Paul said, I, I, I made it a determination not to know anything or preach anything but the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I find that the greatest one of the greatest markers of the apostolic anointing is a genuine concern for the heart of the Lord, for his kingdom, and for his word, it must be our absolute concern. The Lord said, I will have no other gods beside me. There will be no other word beside his. There will, I feel like preaching right now, and I'm trying to behave in the beginning because I'm on fire. I'm trying to behave, but I want us to understand that the Lord said, I will have nothing else beside me. I don't care if it's word. I don't care if it's personality. I don't care what it is. I will have no other God before me. And so this is what we need to understand because there are a lot of uh, false notions going around. All of this stuff, listen, if you are going to make an assertion, let me say this. The Word of God works by principle. It doesn't work by our emotion. It doesn't work by what we think. It works by principle. So we have to stop asserting things that cannot be proven by the Word of God. The Word of God has, because of the Holy Ghost, because the living Word is in the written Word, and the written Word is about the living Word, then the Spirit of God can give us revelation, then we must understand that the Word of God is able to prove itself. Now, it is not able to defend itself, and so uh, that's what in theology we call the field of apologetics. We, as the human agents, have to defend the gospel. We have to earnestly contend for the faith. We're going to take a look at that shortly. Speaking of that, I want to invite everybody to Zephaniah, the third chapter in the eighth verse, which is the substratum, substratum of our concern. Zephaniah, the third chapter in the eighth verse. I also want to invite you to Jude. There's only one chapter there. And I want to, we're going to take a look at three through 13. I'm not sure if I'm going to read all 13 yet, but we're, that's where if I don't read all of it, I want you, that will be our homework. Okay. So Jude, the one and only chapter three, uh, the third verse through the 13th verse. All right. So we need to understand that the word of the Lord, see this, this, this has got to be the pinnacle of what we do as believers, because I'm seeing a lot of my brothers and sisters entangling themselves with political arguments and all of these things. And we've studied in past about where were the intercessors and what were they were doing and see. And so we're, we're, if the Lord's people, if we get out of pocket and we start acting in carnality and we start going away from the word of the Lord, or let me say this, if we put any other word next to it, and that's that's a lot of what why we're having an issue of the true church being seen is because those that are supposed to defend it, we are, we are adding all kind of stuff, and we're putting all kind of stuff in here, and we got all kind of concern, but we as believers in the anointing and power of the Holy Ghost our highest concern has to be to the word of the Lord and the spirit of the Lord and his kingdom. We cannot allow ourselves to get involved in all of this stuff. And I'm not saying that we're not taking action. I'm not saying that we tuck our tail and run. What I'm saying is the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down 
of strongholds, okay? Every thought, every thought, it pulls it into the captivity to the obedience of Christ. It pulls down every high thing that even attempts to exalt itself against the knowledge of Christ. But here's the kicker. If you read that next verse in that passage, the problem is, it says, and having in readiness to revenge all disobedience when our obedience is fulfilled. Listen, my brothers and sisters, we have got to stop being distracted with all of this stuff. Listen, this stuff that has come, it hasn't come for us. The Lord tells us when we see in Matthew 24, the Lord Jesus tells us when we see all these things begin to occur, look up for our redemption draws nice. Tell us, it tells us to rejoice. You see what I'm saying? Not in the tribulation, but in the fact that the Lord is with us. He'll never leave us nor forsake us and he will guide us. And this is why the word of the Lord says, uh, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. He tells us in all our ways, acknowledge him. And what will he do? He shall direct our path. Listen, what I love about the word of the Lord, and I'm, and I'm going to share a, a few things here, but uh, I'm going to allow the Holy Ghost to say exactly what he needs to say. Listen, we have to understand this. And I shared with this in our last time uh, of, I, I shared with this in our last time of sharing that there are many principles concerning the word of God. And there are some we're going to really have to drive down the whole, allow the Holy Spirit to drive down to the depths of our spirit in this season. If we are going to walk victoriously through this season as the Lord is commanding us to. Okay, he has already given us the victory, but we have to walk through here and we have to obtain the victory in real time. The purpose of him revealing things in our hearts in the mystical realm or in the spirit realm is not so they can stay there. It's so they can manifest here. Why? Because the word of the Lord says that his will is to be done in earth as it is in heaven. So let's understand this. The last time I shared with us that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That means that the very word of the Lord, and I'm talking about in holy sacred writ, in the Bible, the written word of God is literally when it says inspired, it means in the short term, they say God breathed. But I like the Greek tense because literally what it's saying is all scripture has been infused with the very fiery breath of the Lord. There's fire in there. That's why when you read the word of the Lord, it quickens you. It brings your spirit and it makes it alive. Many people are walking around and they feel dead. Well, I can give you the see. I can give you the answer on how to come alive. You have got to allow the word of the Lord to invade your spirit because it is a fire, King James says. The King James verse, version uses the word quicken. It quickens you. It means to it means to bring you alive by fire. And that's what the word of God does. That's why it's our strength. That's why it's our everything because it brings our spirit alive by fire. See, all scripture is infused with the very breath of God and fire. That's one of the symbols for the Holy Ghost. The spirit of God is in the word of God and the word of God is in the spirit of God. And Jesus is the living word and the written word is about the living word so that the living word has infused the written word with the very fiery spirit of the Lord. I feel like shouting right now, but I'm, 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 listen, I'm just here to share tonight and I'm trying to behave myself, but this thing is down in my spirit because so many people are falling by the wayside and their faith is being shipwrecked and they're doubting and their absolute concern for the Lord is waning and falling by the wayside and they're in fear and there's no need for any of this. Now more than ever, we have to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to us. To who? To the saints because the word of the lord isn't delivered to the wicked they don't hear it jesus told them they are of the world he told the scribes and pharisees and sadducees of this generation you are of the world that's why you can't hear me but those that are of my father they hear my voice he said my sheep know my voice so let's please understand that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Second Timothy uh, 3 and 16. Second Timothy 3 and 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now let me share this. The word of the Lord does not change because the Lord does not change. Neither does his spirit change. Neither does his spirit. Uh, his spirit does not change. Okay. And so now when we bring in, we'll throw in Matthew, the third chapter and the sixth verse. The Lord says, I at, for I am the Lord. And I change not. So the Lord doesn't change, his kingdom doesn't change, and his word doesn't change. Okay? And then when we throw in James, the first chapter and the 17th verse, not only does the Lord not change, 
the Bible says there's no variableness in him, neither shadow of turning. So not only does our Father in Heaven not change, there's not even an inkling that he's going to change. He's not, in, in other words, man is fickle. And because we're fickle, our word is fickle. But the Lord is not like that. He's not fickle, nor does it, is his word fickle. He does not change, therefore his spirit does not change, therefore his word does not change. So the eternal Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, do not change. Therefore, their word does not change. They are one, therefore their word is one. This is why I can trust in the Lord with all my heart and lean not to my own understanding. In all my ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct my path. Because so many times what we're seeing in the world today, we're seeing so many things. And we have so much confusion. And it is becoming increasingly unstable by the minute. And the reason that is, is because the word of God says Satan is the author of confusion. He is the author of confusion. And so the Lord has made a determination. Let's go to Zephaniah the third chapter. We'll get this. We'll get this uh, 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 substratum scripture out of the way here. Zephaniah the third chapter. Okay. We'll get this out of the way here. Zeca, uh, Zephaniah in the Old Testament. Okay. The third chapter and the eighth verse. And it reads as such, Therefore wait ye upon me, saith the Lord. Now he's talking to every believer. We must wait on the Lord in this season because the wrath, the indignation, and the wrath of the Lord that we see moving did not come for us. See, that's why it behooves us to study the book of Revelation because we must understand, as Jesus said, the times and the seasons. We must know at all times what season we're in as it relates to the kingdom of God, not as it relates to this world. Listen, believers, we live in two worlds. We are of this, we are in this world, but we are not of this world. So we at all times have to be cognizant that we live in two realms. We live on earth, but we have to understand that our citizenship is in heaven. Okay? And if we forget that, that is how Satan gets us caught up in all this mess. And here's the problem. When we get caught up in all this mess, what happens is, what happens is, we get caught up in all this stuff. I'm sorry, I'm turning my fan on here. So, uh, so I can be comfortable here. Listen, so what ha we got all this confusion in the world, and what happens is we get distracted. And that's what Satan wants, because listen, it, the wicked can't receive the word of the Lord, nor can they receive the spirit of the Lord. So my, so the question becomes this, my brothers and sisters, if they can't hear the spirit of the Lord, they can't see the kingdom of God, then that's why the scripture says faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. But how shall they hear except a preacher be said? This is why it's so detrimental because listen, if we get caught up in what the world is doing, then we can't speak the message that they need to hear to them to deliver them. And this happens over and over and over. There's nothing new under the sun, the word of the Lord says. that Satan has no new tricks. He uses the same stuff all the time. The question is, will the generations that find themselves where the world is unstable wake up and realize from the last lessons? That's why we read last time that the whole entire word of God was written for our example and for our admonition and for our learning and for our teaching and for our instruction and also for our correction and also for our rebuke when we refuse to get in the place the Lord has for us to get into. I want to ask my brothers and sisters tonight. I'm not even talking to anybody that's unsafe. You can listen. And I'm sure you, you may, your heart may be touched by this, but I really want to talk to my brothers and sisters tonight and share with us because if we get distracted, how were the world here? If we're distracted in political arguments, if we're distracted with the cares of this life and the deceitfulness of riches and all the things that the parable of the, of, of the sword teaches us to not be struck by, we get the word of the Lord choked out of our heart through bitterness and through deception and through how we feel about our past and the people in it and what was done to us and we, and, and, and it begins to choke the word of the Lord out of our hearts. Then what measure will the Lord have to take to restore his word in the earth. Send angels as he did to Sodom and Gomorrah to destroy it. Send angels, send water on the earth to destroy it as he did in the days of Noah. What will he have to send if there's no mouthpieces?
This is why he has had me preaching about this the last several times of our sharing. Because if the mouthpieces get distracted and the mouthpieces who are not carrying his word prevail, then what, how do the wicked hear? How does the Lord, the Lord, the Apostle Paul calls us ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're ambassadors to the kingdom of the Lord. How do they hear if the ambassadors fail? Please, I pause because I want that to sink deep down in our spirit. That's what King David would say, Selah. That's when he would say, Selah. How are they going to hear if you and I get distracted, my brothers and sisters? How are they going to hear? And see, so we read that there is no shadow in turning of the Lord's word. So when he gives us his word as his commandment, in the Greek that word is apodictic, which is truth expressed as command. That's why everybody's saying, my truth, my truth. Forget your truth. The only truth that matters here is the divine truth of the word of the Lord. And it doesn't matter how we feel about it. It doesn't matter how I think about it. it that's why the Bible tells me to lean not to my own understanding. It doesn't matter if you feel like it. It doesn't matter if you understand everything. All he, what he has greatly called us to do is to speak the word of the Lord. He said what Jesus said, what I tell you in your ear, preach that on the rooftops. Go into all the nations teaching them whatsoever I have said to you. And commanded you. Are we doing that? That is where we all have to self-examine. And make sure that we're lining up with the word of the Lord. Because here's what the Lord has purposed now. Here's what he's purposed. Not in the last generation. We can't concern about ourselves about the last generation. We have to concern ourselves about our time. And our generation. And use the generations of old. As our example and our pattern of what to do. And what not to do. We had a civil rights movement. And yes, it did do something. And let's be clear what it did. It legislated the actions of men. But did it change their hearts? Did it eradicate this ugly creature of hatred in our generation? Not completely. Because there have been men that Satan had, that have been born, that Satan has put this false word in their spirit that we should hate men because of the color of their skin, refusing to acknowledge that we all bleed the same color. And all nations, the scripture said, are made in one blood. And we refuse to acknowledge that. And we're carrying a false word. And we, we, we proselyte people. We're looking for proselytes. And we want to put that word in people. And Jesus said, we make them twofold more the child of the devil than ourselves. This is why it's so important to speak against these false prophets and speak against this false word. Because our hope is to deliver the false prophet from that false word and to drive the false word out into the pastures of hell where it belongs. I feel like preaching now. I, uh, oh, the fire of the Lord is in me. I feel like preaching, but I'm going to behave myself. We got to understand this is what the real battle is. This is a battle for souls. And so the civil rights movement legislated men's actions, but it did not change their heart. And Dr. King, a true prophet, told us that. And so now what we need is another, not another civil rights movement. We need a movement of the Spirit of the Lord. So we need an outpouring of the Spirit of the Lord upon mankind to draw in the greatest harvest we've ever seen. It is the Spirit of the Lord that doesn't legislate men's actions. What it begins with is actually changing the man's heart. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Look at the man. He is changed. He has a new being, a new coherency in the Lord. The Lord's not looking for another civil rights movement. He's already completed that phase. He's looking for a massive over all the entire nations to pour out his spirit. He didn't send his wrath as a killing spree. He has sent his wrath in our time to wipe out all of this false word and everybody that chooses to hold on to it so that he can gain for himself a people of pure language that can call on him. On one accord. Listen to Zephaniah, the third chapter. I always take it to the word of the Lord. Because that's what we're talking about, right? That's what we've been talking, sharing this whole time so far. 
Therefore, wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up. For those of you that just join us, we're in Zephaniah, the third chapter and the eighth verse. Until the day that I rise up to the prey for my determination. Here's what the Lord is saying in our generation is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them my indignation, even all my fierce anger for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. There's that term fire again. Whenever you talk about the Lord, you can't separate the term fire from the Lord. For then will I turn to the people a pure language that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. So the Lord hasn't sent the Lord hasn't sent uh, his his uh, indignation as a killing spree. He t the scripture says he takes no death uh, pleasure in the death of the wicked. The Lord doesn't take pleasure in the death of those that refuse to obey him, but his holiness demands justice. And when we continue to knock at that justice and not answer the command of the Lord, eventually he will take the adjudicating process out of our hands and he will send his wrath. And then there is no deciding for us. Because when we rebelled, which the Bible says is witchcraft and stubbornness is, is the sin of iniquity, when we rebelled, this is when the Lord, after period of grace, those of us, his great, no, his grace is with those who believe, but those that are wicked, his grace has a season. And when that season is up, his judgment is marching forward. And we have to understand this. <laughs> We have to understand this. The Lord is not going to continue to sit there and let us thumb our, our finger in his face and talk about him and say whatever we're big and bad enough to do. Can the clay rebuke the potter? Can the clay say to the potter, Jeremiah said, why have you made me what you made me? Come on. And this is a foul spirit that we think we can sit in the face of the eternal Godhead and say and do whatever we want and nothing's going to happen. It is futile. The Bible says God is not mocked whatsoever a man reap, so it that, that, that shall he also reap. We're going to reap what we sow. We cannot. The holiness of the Lord is not going to let his kingship be uh, thumbed at and be ignored and be downtrodden. It's not going to happen. So we have got to be sober minded and we have got to start thinking. And those of you who are unbelievers and outside of the commonwealth of the faith and outside the kingdom of God and in citizenship, you are going to have to make a decision here because you can't continue in your evil ways. The Lord is commanding all men at this time everywhere to repent. And those of us who say we're anointed in the Holy Ghost, if you truly heard the Holy Ghost, you would hear the Holy Ghost commanding you to begin to tell everybody in your purview that they need to repent. That the kingdom of God is at hand. It's a matter of repentance, my brothers and sisters. We don't have time. Souls are dying and dying a sec, not just a one time, but twice in the going to the lake of fire. And we have time to be concerned about anything else. If you truly love the Lord and you say his spirit is in you, you would know he's speaking this to you. We have to begin to sound off with one word, one language, and it has to be pure. And the purity of the language of the Lord is holiness. Myself and my father were talking the other day, and my and, and, and a scripture came right up in the middle. Of, it was, I know the Lord was in, in, in between us. And we're thousands of miles apart. Well over a thousand miles apart. And truly the Lord said, where two or three are gathered to my, in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And so what happens, a scripture comes up before us. I mean, a, a one that, 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 that hasn't, that hasn't frequented my mind in quite some time. And my father's either, but we both know it well. And I knew the Holy Ghost was in the midst of us. There is a highway, the scripture says, called holiness. And it is a way, the scripture says, that no evil can come into. It says fools can't even frequent this highway. No evil person, no iniquity, no wickedness can go over its path. And the Lord reminded us of that, that there's a highway 
called holiness. And it has been prepared for all of us. Jeremiah said we must return to the old path. What path? Holiness. We have to return to holiness, my brothers and sisters. And I'm not talking about what you, namely what you wear and what you look like and what you sound like, although all of that is critical. I'm talking about the spirit in which you speak and what you are talking about. And who is leading your speech each and every day? Who is leading the word that you're harboring in your heart? All scripture, all word is given by inspiration of God. All word that he speaks to us as his believers, all word that he has presented to the world has his very fiery spirit in it. And so that that lends to us two things, two points of understanding. One, my, fear, my spirit must be on fire, and if it's not, I must stay in worship until the fire of the Holy Ghost hits my spirit. And two, the word that I speak must, must drop with the weight of the fire of the Holy Ghost. Then men might repent. And we shared in times past, out of Jeremiah the 23rd chapter, listen, if you, if we are true prophets of the Lord, we would turn people from their evil ways. So the word that we're speaking must be a word that causes men to repent and turn from their evil ways. And if we're not preaching that, we have the wrong word. I said it. It's inflammatory. And I will, it is highly incendiary. And I am not going to retract it. I'm not going to remove it. Because it is high time that we understand this. We have to, we have to be prophesying a word and speaking a word. That's what prophesy means. To speak a word that turns people from the evil of their doings. Are we doing that? Only each and every one of us can answer the questions, my, that question, my brother and sister. And I want to emphatically state we must answer it because the Lord told Ezekiel, I have made you a watchman on the wall and he's made all of us watchmen. He said, the word that I speak, you must give to them. If you do not, I will require their blood at your hands. They will die in their own sin for not listening. So don't fool yourself thinking they got away. No, the Lord says they will die in their sin for not listening. But he's going to require that word at our hand, their blood at our hand. Can you imagine that? So we have to sober up here. He said that to us, not to put us in fear, but to make us sober-minded. That's what the Apostle Peter preached all through his ministry, to be sober-minded. He counseled the saints to be sober-minded. Are we sober-minded today? Because what I'm looking as I'm going throughout many places and people telling me they're believers, they're not sober-minded. They're either acting in fear or they're acting like the world. And so my question from by way of the Holy Ghost still stands. Where do the sinner and the ungodly appear if judgment begins at the household of faith first? If judgment begins at the house of God, where do the sinner and the ungodly appear? And I'll tell you where they appear. If we don't get the word to them and if they don't listen, the lake of fire is where they will appear. That word to us to be watchmen was not to put us in fear. It was to cause us to be sober-minded. Many of us act like we're drunk in the spirit. The apostle Paul pointed that out. The apostle Peter had to point that out in his generation. And as an apostle of this generation, I have to point out many of us are not sober-minded. You tell me you're saved. You tell me you hear the Holy Ghost. I don't have no argument with you, but then I have a question for you. Why are you not sober-minded? Let's take a look at Jude. Let's go to Jude. Many of you who uh, should be there already, Jude, 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 Jude. One chapter, small book. Jude was James' brother. The apostle Jude has one of the greatest revelatory minds in scripture, and I'm certain in the world over. Jude, Jude, the apostle Jude. The Apostle Jude. This is why I love the Apostle Jude. Look, listen to the revelation of the Lord through his spirit. Beloved. 
Why is that one word? That word, word word makes all the difference in the world. Because the epistles are not just to those that are wicked. The epistles are first and foremost to those that of, of us that are beloved. You say, you say, uh, Bishop, why is that important? Because listen, the Bible says perfect love casts out fear. No believer should fear at this time. I'll emphatically state that. No believer should fear anything at this time because the Lord told us we would only with our eyes would we see and behold the reward of the wicked. Come on, you got to get Psalms 91 deep down in your spirit. And a friend of mine today said people are dying without warning. Said in years past there at least used to be warning. But they are dying without warning. This is how you know the wrath of the Lord is movement is moving. Because there is no time. The spirit of death only gives time when the Lord commands him to. But when the wrath of the Lord comes, we need to study Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. That we will be broken without remedy. The scripture says there won't even be assured left of us. S-H-E-R-D, assured left, to draw water from the water pot. Won't be anything left. We'll be broken without remedy. We won't be able to draw, draw water from, or even put it in the fire. Because the vessel will be completely broken. And that vessel is us if we refuse to obey the word of the Lord. Please hear me carefully. The spirit of the Lord is speaking to all of us. Be loved. He's not talking to the wicked. He's talking to us who say, who confess Jesus Christ and profess that the Holy Ghost, that we're baptized in the Holy Ghost. He is speaking to us, beloved. When I gave all diligence, verse 3, to write unto you of the common salvation. There it is again. It was needful for me to write unto you. And exhort you. And that's what I'm doing now is exhorting us. In the, in the word of the Lord. And in the spirit of the Lord. And in the things of the Lord. He said that ye should earnestly contend for the faith. Which was once delivered unto the saints. Why? Because the church was persecuted. In the time when these apostles were writing. They had to earnestly contend for the faith because Jesus said the kingdom of heaven was going to suffer violence in the earth and the violent were going to attempt to take it by force. And that's what the Roman emperors did when the Roman general Titus rode in in A.D. 70 and destroyed Jerusalem and threw the temple of Solomon down. That's what wickedness always does. Jesus told Peter upon this rock, I'm going to build my church upon what rock? Upon the rock of the revelation that Peter just got for, done professing before the Lord. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. He said upon that rock, that rock of the word of the revelation knowledge of the divine son of God. I'm going to build my church. We preach Jesus. That is the rock that the church is built on. We preach Jesus. That is the word that the church is built on. So why do we have any other word in our mouths and call ourselves prophets of the Lord Jesus Christ, ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ, preachers and teachers and evangelists and apostles for the Lord Jesus Christ when we have another word in our mouths? I'm trying to calm my spirit down, but I told you I'm it's like fire shut up in my bones. We have to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to us. Why? Because the Lord said there are many deceivers that arise this time. The other day I'm looking right in the paper and my eyes, if I had known the word of the Lord, wouldn't almost even believe it. The Russian soul police had to arrest a man because he was claiming to be Christ. Do we hear the spirit of the Lord? Are you, do you have, you, you as a believer, your eyes should be open to all the media right now. Not looking for what your spirit can be tampered with. Not looking at all the evil. Looking at the signs of the times. A woman tried to assassinate the president. Are we seeing this as this, what the spirit of the Lord is showing us? 
The Lord showed me in the spirit. There's a time coming when they will kill Christians and think that they are doing God's service. And a woman attempted to kill the president. And here's the faulty part. He claims to be a Christian. Ah, and there's the problem. Because Satan is getting ready to kill many people who say they're Christians, but are not baptized in the Holy Ghost. You look like us. You sound like us. You even seem to worship like us. But the motivation of your heart is different. And the Spirit of the Lord is saying to me, Son, they are going to kill people that look like my children, but are not my children. All of you who are playing around with Christianity and playing around with being a believer, beware! Because judgment is at hand. She, uh, she attempted to kill the president. And then when the poison didn't get through, she brought a gun to the party. Are you seeing what the Spirit of the Lord is showing us? The instability and the unrest in the world right now, the precarious nature of the world right now, requires the Spirit of God and the Word of God in the outpouring of His Spirit. This train is in full motion and nothing is going to stop it but the Word of the Lord. You must hear the Holy Ghost and hear Him carefully. Please. For there are certain men. Now listen. Listen to the makeup of these men that are in the world and they're here right now. The Apostle Jude. This was written over 2,000 years ago, but it's still, it's like a blueprint of what we're looking at today. For there are certain men, verse 4, crept in unawares. That's because people who are apostate and who've moved away from the principles of God, you don't have the word to mark these foul spirits. You don't have the, the ability to do what the Apostle John said in his first epistle in the, in the, in the fourth chapter in the first verse. Test the spirits to see whether they are of God. So they creep in unaware, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not hear the Spirit of the Lord. And the angels which kept not their first estate. Come on, Lucifer and the one-third of the angels, according to Revelation, the 12th chapter, that he drew out of heaven. And Jesus said, I beheld Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Does anybody know the word in this place today? And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he had preserved an everlasting change under darkness. Everlasting change. That means they will not be broken under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. That's when they will be cast into the lake of fire. Read Revelation the 20th and the 21st chapter. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner. So it wasn't just Sodom and Gomorrah. There were other cities in this same apostasy, in this same wickedness. Giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh. That's homosexuality and lesbianism. Are set forth. For an example, so all of you that keep saying, oh, that was Old Testament, then why? It, listen, your argument does not hold up under the word of the Lord. Be under this one question, if that was Sodom and Gomorrah was the Old Testament, then why is the apostle bringing it up in the new? Get it in your spirit, please. We got to get this in our spirit because we're not thinking soberly. All scripture. Is given by the fire breathing of the Lord and is profitable for our instruction. Are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. You told me that was the God of the Old Testament. Then why is the apostle preaching it in the new? And he's not the only one. Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh despise dominion and speak evil of dignities uh-huh we got one in the white house right now speaking evil of dignities yet michael the archangel 
When contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuked thee. But these speak evil of those things which they know not. But what they know naturally, because they're not spiritual, even though they claim to be, as brute beasts in those things, they corrupt themselves. And we have several corrupt houses in this country and the nations over. The White House, the political houses of other nations, the state house and the church house are all corrupt because they are full of corrupt men and women who think they can cast off the cords of the Lord and the Lord isn't going to answer you, but he is. And he's doing it right now with ever increasing, increasing measure. And he's going to pour out his determ his uh, his indignation until he, according to what his heart has determined, and his word will not re uh, return void. And it will it will be poured out till it is accomplished. All the Lord's heart has purpose and determined. Make no mistake about it. Be warned. Because we're already in the throes of it. This isn't coming, it's already here. And that's the mistake many people are making. You think it's on its way. No, it's already started. It's already here. And if I be a prophet and servant of the Lord, it came in March. Zephaniah 3 and 8 began in March. And it is going to kick up another notch in November. You mark my words by way of the Spirit of God. In November, it is going to kick up another notch. I'm not talking about because of, see, we're always thinking somewhere else. I'm not talking about because of the political election. I'm talking about because the Lord has made a determination. Verse 11, woe unto them. Be warned, beware. For they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily. Hear the spirit of the Lord carefully. After the era of Balaam for reward and perished in the game saying of Cory of Cory I'm gonna stop at verse 11 before I finish 12 and 13 to share something the Lord has laid in my heart and this is directly from the throne room and the Spirit of the Lord is speaking this to me right through this video right now because listen if you're not listening right now this video will come into the hands of those that are going to need it and you will listen and you will hear and please if you are who i'm talking to in down the road here i want you to get, gain instruction by way of the holy ghost what the apostle jude is saying here and this is why he says woe unto them. And we have to give the revelation. It says, for these men have gone in the way of Cain. What? And in the way of Cain. They have erred. They have entered into the era of Balaam for reward, for money. And perished in the gainsaying of Corrie. What is the Apostle Jude alerting us to? What is he warning us about? This is what the Spirit of the Lord laid in my heart. These wicked false prophets in the world today are going to begin to kill the Lord's anointed and curse the Lord's anointed and even speak against the Lord's anointed. Kill them. Attempt to curse them. And even attempt to kill them. They're going to attempt to speak against them. I'm going to say it again. He is warning us. The Holy Ghost is signified in this word and given all of his servants this to understand. These men, if it were possible and it's not, they are going to attempt to kill the Lord's anointed. Curse the Lord's anointed and speak against the Lord's anointed. But I serve you notice the Lord has sealed us. And in the unlikened times past, we are not the generation you're going to be able to kill, to speak against, or to curse. Hear the Spirit of the Lord, all my brothers and sisters. You have got to know that the Word of the Lord is in your spirit, because it's coming. 
But the Lord is divinely protecting us. They won't be able to kill us. They won't be able to curse us. And they won't be able to speak against us. But the Bible says these men are of such a nature. So be warned. The Lord signified five years ago. He began to work in my spirit to understand I was coming to a time when these men would arise. <clears throat> he said, son, do not fear them. For I am able to deliver you. And I am certain he's able to deliver the righteous out of all our afflictions and all of our troubles. But the time is here and now. It's coming. These are spots, as I hasten, in Feast of Charity. The Apostle Jude said, these are spots in your Feast of Charity, your Feast of Love. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. They don't even fear the spirit of the Lord because they do not see him because they do not hear him. And those that do, they don't retain what he's saying and his spirit and they don't retain the edicts of the Lord in their hearts. Clouds they are, he sa says. Clouds they are without water. Carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit twice dead, plucked up by the roots. That's why we don't fear them, because they're already twice dead, and they're already plucked up by the roots. Why are they plucked up by the roots? Because the Spirit of the Lord has made a determination against them to pluck them up and remove them from this earth realm so that he can separate the wheat and the tare. He's made a determination to separate the wheat and the tare so that he can have a harvest. And a magnanimous one at that. Raging waves of the sea, the Apostle Jude says, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. That is the lake of fire. They are twice dead. And I've shared, the Spirit of the Lord has had me sharing for a while now. That is appointed unto men to die once, after that the judgment. But what has not been preached to us, what we have not been alerted to, there's a second death coming. For those whose name is not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. For those who grievously and wickedly and stubbornly turn from the word of the Lord. Like many of you that keep coming on and going off. Turning it off because you don't want to hear what the prophet is saying. But I promise you, Jesus said in that day, oh, in that day, he said, I won't judge you. But the word that I've spoken to you, that will judge you. You know, the word you keep turning off because you don't want to. That preacher is inciting fear. That preacher is speaking about things that I don't want to hear, but you'll want to hear it. But it'll be too late. So here now, all of you who are rebellious and wicked here now while you have a chance. Because the time is drawing nigh where you won't. If you take your last breath, hear me carefully, and you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you will die twice, and you will spend the remainder of eternity in the lake of fire. You say, preacher, I don't believe that. You will when you get there. The only problem is, you won't be able to come out. So Catholicism has it wrong. There is no purgatory, and you won't be coming out. Universalism has it wrong. Not everybody is going to be saved. Not everybody is going to be saved. Not because Jesus didn't die for the whole world, but because the whole world refuses to acknowledge that. And our refusal to acknowledge it is what is going to bring us to the point of a second death. You say, preacher, you're preaching fear. Let me explain something to you. I wouldn't be concerned about fear because Jesus preached fear. You say he did? Oh, yes. And see, that's why we don't know the word of the Lord because we don't read our Bibles. Jesus said, I'll tell you who you don't fear. He said, don't fear the ones that after they killed your body, they can do no more. Jesus said, I'll tell you the one you should fear. That after your body is dead, he can cast your spirit and your soul alive into hell. So you say, preachers, you aren't supposed to be preaching fear. Oh, yes, we are because Jesus did. 
Don't tell me what I'm not supposed to be preaching. You're not my king and you don't have the spirit of the Lord. You did not save me and call me. I preach because my king has commanded me to preach and none other. I don't like that preacher. Well, talk to the Lord about it because it's of no concern for me. I'd rather speak the true word of the Lord in an attempt to, for your soul salvation and your life to be saved eternally than sit up here and preach smooth things to you and deceits to you and you die and go to hell. How is that love? You say, well, the Lord is supposed to love all of us. He does. And that's why he has his mouthpieces sounding off to warn you. Preaching the gospel to you. And I'll share this with all of you. Listen, for the past 27 years, it didn't make a difference to me what I had to go through, who I had to do deal with, what what suffering I had to go through, tribulation and persecution. It didn't matter. I've heard, I've been called everything this side of the sun except a child of the king. And I've continued to preach. And I will continue to carry out this mission the Lord has given me and this ministry has given me until I take my last breath. And I don't care what I, I what I go through or anybody else goes through. I'm going to speak the word of the Lord. And when he sees me in that day, how about you? You know the word. Is he going to be able to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant? Many of us he is. But those of you who refuse to hear he won't be able to say that to you. You know what he's going to have to say to you? Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Oh, Bishop, I'm safe. I don't have nothing to worry about. I don't have to, I don't have to go that way. Oh, no. Then explain to me the word of the Lord says one faith, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. It's one spirit. It's one word as we researched earlier. So you explain to me how you think you're going to have another word in your heart and you're going to defy the king in that word. He said, it's that very word that's going to judge you. That very word that you're carrying in your heart that is outside the purview of the spirit and the word of God. He said, that word is going to judge you because when I put my word to it, your word won't be able to stand up under the weight of holiness. And that's why the scripture tells us to follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Tells us to walk in the pathway in the highway of holiness. Said no ungodly will enter, go across that path. Neither will the fools enter. Don't be foolish. Hear the spirit of the Lord. Those of you that believe but are not baptized in the Holy Ghost, you are going to have to get in your secret closet until the Lord endows you with his spirit. Ask him, what are you waiting on? Time is ticking. These men are already in the earth realm. I'm going to leave you with this question tonight. And I think it's absolutely profound because the spirit of the Lord asked me years ago, could we see right here, in the United States of America, another Adolf Hitler. Could we have happen here what happened in Germany of World War II? You say no preacher, it can't. I beg to differ. Adolf Hitler was the greatest or considered one of the greatest orators in oratorical history. And he was able to deceive an entire nation into the murder of millions, mass murdering, simply by the words proceeding from his mouth. You say it's not a battle of words? Wrong. It is exactly that. The word that a man and a woman or a child is carrying in their mouth is of the utmost concern and should be. The Apostle James said, wars have been started by that small member. What a small member it is. He said, it is set on the very course of the fires of hell. When you have men who are void of the word of God in their mouth, they set on course the very fires of hell. That is World War II in a single statement. All of the nations being set on the very course of the fires of hell. 
So my brothers and sisters, that's all we have time for tonight. I have shared with you what the Lord has laid on my heart. And I pray that you will watch this over and over and over. And really let the word of the Lord sink deep down in your spirit. And seek the Lord as to what you need to be doing in this day and time. As this world is growing more and more unstable. The Lord is seeking to stabilize it. And he is going to do it. It's not a if, shoulda, coulda, and a woulda. He is going to do it through the mouth of his servants. And the word that is in our mouth. All right, I love all of you tonight. All my family and friends, even my enemies of the cross all across the world. Please hear the word of the Lord. Accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And be baptized in the Holy Ghost. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. For the remission of your sins. You shall be converted and you shall be healed. All right, that's all I have time for tonight. I love you all again, and I bid you a good night. Bye for now.